Welcome. The very first video of asset pricing. I'm excited. I hope you are too. Asset pricing is based on facts. So we're going to review the interesting facts behind asset pricing today. It's sort of like astronomy. We think we knew what was out there. And then when we go look at the facts, it's unimaginably weird. And then all our theories have to change. Uh, and that certainly happened several times. And when we develop the theories, I want to develop the theories on top of the facts. These things don't just come out of nowhere. They come out of trying to understand the very difficult facts. So we'll today look at a bunch of the facts that you should keep in mind for understanding the theories. We'll go back and learn some theories. And then we'll look at all these facts in much more detail later on. So first set of facts, facts about stock markets, the equity premium, uh, risk and return. Take a look at the first picture. On the first picture I've shown, the uh, total um, return on the stock market versus bond market. So this is if you invest $1 in 1926 in stocks versus bonds, how much money do you have at each date? I've taken out inflation. So these are real quantities, uh, not, just the, not, not just the reflecting inflation. As you can see, stocks earned a whole lot more than bonds. If your great grandfather or grandmother put $1 in stocks, in 1926, you would have about 250 real dollars today. If he or she had put them in bonds, uh, the red line isn't exactly at zero, but it's not doing great. So stocks, fact one, stocks paid a lot more than bonds. We can see this more clearly in the next graph. Here I've used a log scale. We take logs all the time. It's a good set of units because moving up by one unit of log is the same percentage increase uh, no matter where you start from. So this shows you, um, again, the, you can see the stocks have gone up much more than the bonds. You can see here that bonds do go up and down, just like stocks go up and down. Uh, how could bonds go down? Those are the effects of inflation coming and going. So one, this is, you can see that the zero means e to the zero, or one dollar. And you've done a little bit in bonds, but mo so much more in stocks. So stocks earn a great deal more than bonds. You can also see a little bit better in this graph how they bounce up and down. And you can see by taking logs how uh, stocks look sort of the same over time. They go up and down and up and down, but it's not vastly different behavior later than earlier. So stocks are great. Class over. Go buy stocks, right? No. That's not how we think about things, and that, that's not the point of asset pricing. This is not a great secret. It's been going on for 60, 70 years. The puzzle is, why didn't people all put their money into stocks knowing how great stocks were? And that's the way we'll think about things this quarter. We'll think about an economic equilibrium. We want to ask the question, if people didn't just do this, if, if it wasn't so easy to make money, uh, then it must be the case that stocks are risky, that people know this that they're leaving those great returns on the table because they're afraid of the risk. So the way we think about stock markets is what's the economic equilibrium, what is the risk in stocks that are making them afraid of stocks relative to bonds. Uh, I put some numbers up here, which will go along with the tables. These numbers are also in the, uh, in the notes in the overhead. Uh, stocks earned real 8.6% per year from 1926. Bonds earned real 1.3%. That's what you've seen from the graph so far. Well, risk, where's this risk? You can see that to some extent in the stocks going up and down there. And I want to make you feel that this risk is real. And it's plausible that people don't all just put their money in stocks because they're afraid of the risk. Let's take a look at the next graph. This is a useful one to keep in mind. These are percentage returns on stocks and bonds. These are annual data, so each point is a year. And you can see the stock returns going up and down and up and down and up and down. There is a lot of risk in stocks. Numerically, I have here standard deviations. The stock returns are 17%. The bond returns are 2.6%, much safer, standard deviation. The difference between stock and bonds, that's the equity premium, how much you make if you borrow in the bonds and, lend in the and, and invest in the stocks, 7% mean 18% standard deviation. Those numbers, to make those numbers come alive, look, look at the possibilities of losing money in the stock market. Uh, negative 30%, negative 40%, those things happen. Of course, plus 30 and plus 40 happens as well. 
So it's not surprising that there are years, it's perfectly normal for years with plus or minus 20% uh, stock returns. There's a lot of risk in stock returns and much less in the bond returns. Most of what you're seeing there is just inflation coming and going. Um, to make it come alive even more, I had some fun on the next plot. Uh, this is back to our real value invested, but then I cherry picked a few data points to show you uh, so some of the things, the bad things that can happen. Uh, if, in fact, your grandfather or grandmother bought stocks in 1929, uh, then I put in the dashed red line, I put what happens if you put your money into stocks versus bonds right at that point. And you can see that if you put your money into bonds, stocks versus bonds in 1929, of course, there was a great crash. And the stock market did not recover. You didn't come back to even. You didn't get your money back until 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, 6, 7, 8, 9, 10, 11, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16, 17 years. You lost money for 17 years. Same thing happened if your uh, uh, parent, the grandparents invested in 1968. Then it was more like 25 years before they made the, got their money back. Uh, and if uh, you or your parents invested in uh, 1999, we're still just barely about to make our money back stock versus bonds. Now what happens if you compare the return graph? What happens is there can be several years in a row where the stocks are low. You don't really notice that with the yanging up and down of the graph. Several years in a row of, of low returns accumulates to substantial risk. So it's easy to say, oh, stocks are safer in the long run for long run investors. But long run can be a very long time. You may have to wait 20 years to get your money back, which isn't great news if you're 65 when you make the investment. So stocks are risky. Um, now, one of the big questions for us is, why do stocks vary so much? Why are returns so incredibly volatile? Why is it that stocks jump up and down? Our job is to connect things to macroeconomics, to explain the economics of stock returns. So let's look a little bit at the underlying facts about our economy. In the plot real GDP and consumption, I have in the uh, black line GDP, national output, and in the green line consumption. We use consumption a lot in asset pricing, as you'll see, because that's a real measure of how, how well are people doing. Uh, and this looks like a trend line. Our friends in growth theory make fun of all macroeconomics. They point out that even a severe recession like we just had makes this only the fourth worst year in the entire 100,000 years of human history. Who's complaining so much? Well, lots of people complain. You can see there is fluctuations. But, the, but uh, compared with overall growth, our economy is remarkably, uh, is, is, there's not that much risk. There is risk. There's risk of recessions. You see it going up and down. But the risk of recessions is so much smaller than the risk in the stock market. Compare that graph to our, uh, our real value of a dollar invested graph. You can see this thing goes up and down a whole lot more. That's in a log scale. Whereas the macroeconomic risks, while real, are much smaller. So that's a fact. That's a fact we'll have to digest in our theories. That's the heart of the equity premium puzzle. But an explanation of asset pricing has to take those macroeconomic risks and translate them into financial risks. And those have to be the risks people are scared of that keeps them from, from getting the great returns. GDP and consumption growth, the next graph, uh, shows you the same thing in growth rates. So you can see that GDP and consumption both go up and down. They go down in recessions. They go up in booms. Uh, so there is variation. There, there's volatility. These are the things people worry about. Recessions are bad economic times. Booms are good economic times. To give some sense of the numbers, uh, GDP and consumption go up about 3% a year. That's on an aggregate basis. Some of that's population. It's more like 2%, 1% to 2% per capita. And notice the volatilities. These are like 2.6%, 2.1%, 2.0%. So you can see in the volatility numbers, the GDP and consumption are, are much, much uh, more stable than asset pricing. So there's our puzzle. Uh, uh, stocks pay a lot, a lot, but they're very volatile. Why are stocks so volatile compared to the underlying economic fundamentals? 
there's a big puzzle for us to, to work on this quarter. Here is a comparison graph along with the numbers. Uh, so the graph stock returns and consumption GDP growth just makes the point. Look how volatile stocks are. Look how volatile they are compared to the economic fundamentals. Now, they're not disconnected. In this graph, you can notice that there is a clear connection between stock returns and the underlying macroeconomy. Uh, it's, if, if you've been awake at all in the last couple of years, no surprise, in 2008 and 9 we had a horrible recession. That's the green and black line going down. And it was a horrible time for stock returns. Stocks go down in bad times, and they go up in good times. Happened in the previous 2000 recession. That's a strong pattern. I've captured that for us here in correlations. What is the correlation between the excess return and these various measures of the economy, 0 0.32, 0 0.39, 0 0.43? And you can see there that there is a strong correlation between stock returns and GDP growth. So there are our challenges. Stocks over bonds, there is a strong risk premium stock versus bonds. There's a lot of volatility in stocks. So there's puzzling amount of volatility. Why do, why do stocks pay so much and people don't take advantage of it? Must be risk. There seems to be risk. We'll find that volatility isn't the answer for, isn't the way we characterize risk. Um, but why is there so much risk in stocks compared to the risk in the actual economy? Stocks are correlated with the economy, but much, much riskier. That's a big set of facts for us to digest and think about as we make our theories. So let me summarize the facts we've learned here. The equity premium is big. The equity premium is the average return of stocks over bonds. It's about 7%. Why doesn't everybody put their money into stocks? Well, there must be risk. Stocks must be riskier than bonds, and that makes people afraid of them. We have one measure of risk. We looked at the volatility. Fact two, stocks are much more volatile than bonds. As a number to keep in mind, the standard deviation of this stock minus bond return is about 18% on an annual basis. That's a big risk. Is that the right measure of risk? No, but it certainly makes you think about what is the right measure of risk, and that's what we'll spend a lot of time thinking about. Now, why are stocks so risky? Uh, stocks are correlated with the economy. That makes a lot of sense, but nonetheless, we have another puzzle. Uh, even though they're correlated with the economy, as they ought to be, why do they move around quite so much? So those are our basic facts. Let's do some theory to find out where they come from.